This episode of the House of Mystery is brought to you by Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. LegacyFoodStorage.com Fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Okay, we are back in the House of Mystery. And of course, it's another what blockbuster show for you today. Um, and we've got the great Dr. Eric Shapiro uh, <laughs> as the co host today. Yeah, I'm always good, even when I'm bad. Not oh, good. It. That's a good take. Uh, today we have Matt Birkbeck. Thank you for being here, Matt. Thank you for having me. I talk to a lot of true crime. I have for, what, over 10 years now and uh, written some myself. You're one of those guys that you really sort of take your cases to heart. Like, you, you, you are really part of the cases. I think that's a, well, um, I, I, I mean, I do to a point in that as a journalist, you're supposed to remain objective, obviously, and just follow the facts. Um, and I was, as a, you know, in my career as an investigative journalist. Um, but when I started writing books, I actually got involved in two cases that really had no ending. And that was the one that we had talked about previously, the Robert Durst case. Um, and then this other book that I did right after Durst. Durst I first did in 2002. So you can, it tells you how far back I went with that. This was my second book. I did another book called The Beautiful Child, which came out in 2004. And that one, I think, became uh, I became even far more involved in, uh, only because the book had no ending. And there was this beautiful soul in the middle of it who lived this incredibly horrendous life. And we needed to find her identity. And, you know, the reaction to that particular book kept that case alive for 10 years until the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children and the FBI um, solved it. So, um, yes, I do. I, I did, to answer your question, yes, I did get involved more so, and I probably did put more heart into them than I typically would as a, if I was writing a magazine piece or, you know, my prior life as a newspaper reporter. What is that? Is it just because it didn't really have an ending at the time, or is it that you um, you really actually, I sort of put it toward you probably really feel for the people involved. I did. I felt for, you know, in, in the Durst case, I felt for the McCormick family. Um, it was Kathy Durst's family, for people who are familiar with the Durst case. This one, uh, I felt for the friend's, who I had interviewed. Um, so A Beautiful Child, which I wrote in 2004, told the story of a girl by the name of Sharon Marshall. And I came across that story from a friend, a private investigator in Texas, who just sent me an email and said, you got to take a look at this. And there was a picture of a girl sitting in the lap of a man. It was supposed to be a father and daughter picture, only it wasn't. It just really looked out of sorts. And she looked very unhappy, and he looked um, anything but a, a father. And underneath, it was a it was just you know um, caption, and it said that this girl was kidnapped, raised by a fugitive as his daughter. He subsequently married her, uh, killed her, and then killed, kidnapped her her son out of his first grade classroom, and and killed him too now on the surface that's just a horrendous story right? right uh but what really got me was that this girl somehow found 
the um, just found a way to succeed. She found these. She found a way to succeed while she was in high school, for instance. And everyone, everyone who knew her had no idea what was going on behind the scenes. She lived alone with her father, um, but she was a brilliant student. She had you know A's and B's. She earned a full scholarship to Georgia Tech to study aerospace engineering. Her dream was to work on the space shuttle. And the more that I spoke to people that knew her, the more, I mean, everyone who actually read the story and got to know her loved her. And so we all loved her. And, but we wanted to find her identity. And it was, it was hard. It was really, you know, it took, like I said, it took 10 years. I actually went into, I went down to Florida, the guy that actually kidnapped her and raised her. His name is Frank, his real name is Franklin Floyd. He used many names during the course of his miserable life. But um, I went down and interviewed him in 2003 and s- spent four hours with him. And he'd just been convicted of another murder that's part of this case and was sentenced to death row. And it was the worst, it was the most disturbing interview I had ever done in my life. And he wouldn't give me anything then. I mean, in terms of who she really was. So the, the job at that point in time and, you know, the reaction from the readership, which actually it stretched out across the world. I mean, I was getting emails from people in from almost every continent. Um, people had read the book and they all wanted to find out who we knew her as Sharon. All these years we knew her as Sharon and he wanted to help find Sharon's identity. And he kept the story alive for for years and I blog about it. And, you know, the FBI agent that was involved in the kidnapping of her son, Joe Fitzpatrick, became a, um, you know, not just a great resource to me, but also a friend. And, you know, he had retired and he kept on with it with me. And, um, you know, we were lucky to, at least through the FBI and the National Center, find her identity. And that led to the sequel that I wrote in 2018 called Finding Sharon, which we just released the audio book a few months ago. Uh, how, how old was she when she died, when he killed her? Uh, she was, she was, well, as we know now, she was 20, she was 20 years old. Okay, so she was on her way to becoming this person as she had all this potential. She had, yeah, well, that was basically what it was. She had all this potential in high school. She ends up getting pregnant, and then all her dreams were basically taken away from her by her so-called father, who forced her into becoming a stripper and a prostitute. Oh, she became pregnant by him or by somebody else? No, no. Um, we had actually, people actually thought that. Right. But DNA testing proved otherwise. Um, and no. he, and then, so then he killed her and he killed her son. Well, we be, yeah, she was plotting, yeah. To, she was plotting to finally leave him basically to save her son because right. she, they were, they were in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the time working as, a, she was working as a stripper seven days a week and she knew that if, uh, that he was basically planning to have her re- have him replace her. So we believe he was never convicted of her murder, but she was hit in a suspicious hit and run accident that, you know, everyone believes he had basically set up. And then four, four years later, he, after he lost custody of the boy, he had, ends up going into the school in Oklahoma, his first grade classroom and kidnaps him right, right from the school. And he's never seen again. Wow. Okay. And what was, so what, uh, so what, precisely was he charged with that put him on death row it's a very complicated and confusing story and okay. that was kind of a chore when i wrote the original book and trying to how do i tell this crazy story which you know across different uh many years and different cities and whatnot and different names um after high school she ended up in tampa stripping and working as a prostitute but she was stripping at this club called the mons venus it's a famous club in tampa and she befriended another dancer there named Shella Camessa. And her remains were found several years later. The, the so-called father, whose name is Franklin Floyd, had killed her in a dispute. And then they, they had fled from Florida right after that. And then, as it turns out, in this really bizarre turn of events, right after his trial, um, or during his trial in 1995, I believe it was, um, they, find, they found pictures that he had hidden in a truck of other girls he had abused, he was a pedophile, but also of this woman who was being beaten and tortured. And the FBI agent, Joe Fitzpatrick, had no idea who it was, but saw tan lines on her, knew that they had lived in Florida, sent them to Tampa. And around that time, just before that, um, 
a skeleton had popped up. And so a year later, they were able to identify the girl. It was this girl, Cheryl Camessa, that he had killed. And he was, he was convicted of murdering her in 2002. Oh, I see. Okay. So it stands to reason, like, in addition to Sharon, I mean, it, it sounds like he's killed an assortment of people. He killed, at least, he killed at least three. We believe, I mean, those who followed the story believe that he's killed others, although, you know, we haven't been able to prove it. And like I said, it's a, it's a horrendous story. What was remarkable about the story was this girl that was known as Sharon. And, you know, she had a number of names. Some were taken off of tombstones. You know, she was kidnapped when she was three, four years old. And we didn't know exactly how he got her until we learned her identity. And the FBI actually found her real parents. And this was actually the beauty of the book in terms of keeping the story alive. And then subsequently, the people that actually did the work, which was the National Center and the FBI, they found her parents and found how the mother had met Floyd and how she had been taken but then we also found, you know, um, an uncle, another cousin, so other extended family members. And through the book, we also found this daughter that she had given up for adoption in 1989. Um, after they had, after Floyd had murdered this girl, Cheryl Camessa, they had gone to New Orleans. Um, they had taken name, another name, they had taken names off of tombstones again. And then, unbelievably, he marries her. And um, that's when they went to Tulsa, and then nine months later, it kills her. But the, in New Orleans, she gives birth to a to a girl who the mother reached out to me after the book came out, and you know we kept her identity a secret for a number of years. Um, but I actually just went to her wedding like two weeks ago in New Orleans, um, and she turned out to be she grew up to be just this beautiful young woman who is exactly how Sharon probably would have been had she been allowed to, you know, grow and flourish. Now, this Delano, too, Franklin Delano Floyd, he, he didn't like you. He knew of your book, too, didn't he? He, well, I went to see him during the initial research. So I got, I had, I had interviewed him right after he was convicted. It was in the fall of 2002. Told him I was working on a book. To this day, I have no idea why he sat down with me. What was fortunate, even though it was a miserable, brutal interview, what was fortunate was that he was, since he, he had acted as his own attorney, he had access to all the discovery, and he had it with him in the prison. And he let me make copies of everything. And it was a treasure trove of information. It basically tr tracked their lives for all the time that he had her, including through school and her um, report cards and letters and things like that. And his life, he had grown up in, you know, he was, he was sent to an orphanage and grew up in a, in a Georgia Children's Baptist home. And um, so he gave me this treasure trove of material. I, I go to meet him. I spend four hours with him. The book comes out in 2004. I did go back to visit with him, and I, he was not happy to see me. Um, so, yeah, he did read the book. He was just, <laughs> yeah, he wasn't happy. It was like it was a two-hour thing. Thankfully, this time, the first interview, he and I were in a room alone. The second interview, they had the plexiglass between us. So for that, I guess I was a bit thankful. Oh, I see. And he's been, has he been executed already? No, he was been, he's been on death row since. And just through some issues in Florida um, with legislation and other legalities, the, you know, death row, death row inmates apparently aren't on death row. So okay. even though he's still on death row, he's not going to be executed. He's not in good health. I did try to reach him for this. There's this other project that I've been working on. And um, we did try to reach him, but he didn't respond. That's an interesting insight into the criminal mind. Like, what might he have expected from the book? Like, like I can't imagine what the gap was between how he expected to be depicted and what he, he read. Do you have any insight on that? Like, what might have outraged him or caught him by surprise? Oh, it's just the story that I told because he denied everything. He denied he denied kidnapping her. He denied killing the boy Michael. He denied um, killing this girl Cheryl Camesso. So obviously, I wrote that he did. Um, well, at least he was convicted of kidnapping Michael, and he was convicted of killing Cheryl Camesso. Um, he did admit in 2014 to the when he, the FBI. So basically, again, the story was the book came out in '04. Story stayed alive for 10 years. National Center decides to dig in. 
they bring in the FBI from Oklahoma. Two, two FBI agents go to death row to interview him. And they actually got him to finally admit to killing Michael and to the identity of the girl that we knew, Sharon. And to me, that was just, it was remarkable the way that they, that they actually did that. So, um, but to talk to me, he probably thought for some reason in his crazy mind, I could write something that would help him with his case and maybe exonerate him. Yeah. yeah miracul- miraculously exonerate him. So, um, I have no idea. Well, wow. so with the, with the new book where the focus is on Sharon, is it more, it almost sounds like it's less of an outright crime story than it is almost a biography, like uh, more of a study of her. Is that accurate? Actually, it's part memoir. Um, so, so, we, so, you know, just going to the first part of this conversation and, you know, talking about put some heart into it, um, you know, which I did. And it was because, you know, as I said earlier, it was because of her. And in trying to, you know, and the reaction from readers, because everyone, everyone who read the book fell in love with her. And I mean, I, I had never in my career, and I've written seven books, I have never gotten letters and emails from readers like I have with this book. People were just devastated, um, or the story just lingered with them for weeks, for months. They, could, they were haunted. They just couldn't get it out of their heads, their minds. Um, and so... You know, in putting it, so basically the story that I told was how we found her identity. You know, the the story of Sharon Marshall and Franklin Floyd and the kidnapping and everything I told in A Beautiful Child. What was frustrating about that book is that it didn't have an ending. I was hoping during the course of writing the book, I'd find out who she was, and I didn't. So when the book came out, the task was, or the hope was, that we'd find her identity. And we were actually getting... Uh, readers were sending in tips, like maybe she could be this girl, or maybe she could be that girl. And so a year after the book came out, when we found Sharon's daughter, actually, she found that her mother found me, she emailed me and said, uh, you know, sent me an anonymous email with the with the DNA of Sharon's daughter help you. And we ended up connecting and we did have a DNA test done. And it was a match. And now that we had her blood and put it in the FBI database, CODIS, we were able to check on these different tips that we were getting. And so two or three of them were really good in that it was the right age. You know, the timeline was good. The girl went missing around the time that Sharon probably went missing. Um, and the National Center agreed to do the DNA testing. And they did only, you know, each time we did it, it came up negative. So... Um, you know, we just kept at it. I kept at it. Joe Fitzpatrick, the FBI agent, kept at it. Readers kept at it. I kept writing blogs. People would just keep keep sending in tips. The FBI never really gave up on it. They just didn't have anything really to go on. You know, like we had gotten another tip in 2012 about something that happened in the Smoky Mountains. Another case, I think her name was Janet Carter. And I would write, you know, I'd write blog items and readers of the book would just, you know, stay with it. Uh, Finding Sharon is more about what happened after A Beautiful Child was published, some of the people we found, new friends that we found, the daughter that we found, the efforts to actually go to when the National Center decided to take another shot at this, um, you know, describes what they did, how it went to the FBI, the remarkable job that these two FBI agents did, Scott Lobb and Nate Furr. I mean, they basically prepared for months to go talk to Franklin Floyd. Um, and Nate Fur is an interview expert. And they, you know, they did everything from, you know, they had the book. The book was in the FBI file there. You know, they read through the book. They read through all of, you know, the files that the National Center had. had. They looked up on YouTube. They, you know, looked at interviews. They got to see Floyd, you know, in newsreels and whatnot. And they ended up going down there. I mean, apparently this was happening. I didn't know about this at the time, that what was going on. Apparently, you know, they this was just for law enforcement only, which is fine with me. You know, Joe Fitzpatrick apparently wanted to bring bring me in into the loop. And, you know, they told him this, you know, we're just going to keep it within law enforcement. And he explained that to me afterwards. And I was like, fine, it didn't matter. It was just really about, you know, finding her identity. I was just happy. I remember when Joe called me. Joe called me in, in 2014 and said, you know, Actually, he emailed me and says, call me. And I did. I go, what's up? And, you know, he was pretty 
he was pretty happy and he's, he was, you know, he, he's a good guy, but he's not like the happiest guy when you get on the phone with him. And I, I was like, all right, so what's going on? Did we get another tip or something? And it was just, you know, we found her identity. And then he explained to me what happened. And her real name is Suzanne Savakis. And she was born in Michigan. And she was taken when her mother went to prison. Um, you know, Floyd married her mother. And after he got out of prison, he had been in prison for 10 years. And he, he got out of prison in the early 1970s, somehow meets the mother. Ma she already has three kids. Marries her, like, within a week or two because her kids had been put, uh, taken by the state. She gets the kids back. They end up in um, Texas. She goes to prison for a month, and he, he leaves with her, with Suzanne. And, you know, he had been a convicted pedophile, so God knows what he had put her through over those years. You know, with a story like this um, and how he got away with this, um, does it make you wonder how many other children are stuck in this situation out there as well today? So that's a really good question because at that time in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, you know, law enforcement for the most part didn't care about missing children. You know, you'd report a child missing and they'd say, well, you know, let's wait 24 hours or 48 hours and see what turns up. And it was over the course of years, and I addressed this in the first book, In a Beautiful Child. It was over the course of years, starting with John Walsh, when he lost his son, his son was murdered, um, that, you know, Congress started taking a harder look at missing children in America. And it slowly evolved and continued to evolve to where now a child goes missing two hours later, you know, just, you, you got a two hour window and police are on it immediately. That said, I'm sure there are still many, many children that are dealing with that kind of abuse, whether it be from someone that is not a family member or even or even a family member or a so-called family member. So, but it has, things have improved to where I, I it might, I, I, would, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it'd probably be difficult to have another situation like a Sharon Marshall situation. Just because of the amount of, uh, investigative resources they can put towards something like that. Yeah. So like if a parent goes in, you know, like in that day, you know, the story is really conflicting. It's like yeah, the mother had some major issues. She was, you know, she was a prostitute and she just gave the kids up at one point. I spoke to one of the other daughters and she actually tried to sell after Sharon was taken, you know, the mother allegedly tried to sell the other two kids. And she claimed she had gone to the law, to law enforcement. They just ignored her. If someone went to law enforcement today and said, my child was taken, they would be, they would not tell you to come back in a day or two days or whatever. They'd be on it almost immediately. And so the person that has the child, they'd be looking for them. They couldn't get far away. Right. And then there, yeah, there's the factor of like Amber alerts and alerts going to cell phones and things. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's all, I mean, you could see, you could see how far we've come when it comes to missing children. When you're writing, Finding Sharon, it sounds like the, um, the blog posts were part of the development of the content. I'm so curious about how you, you put it together chronologically. Like, is the book structured chronologically? Were you learning more info as you were writing it? Or was it more that the info accumulated, and then when you said, okay, there's enough here for a book, you started on the book? So what happened was the reason I did the book is because so many people um, – Readers kept the story alive, right? It's one thing, you know, I mean, you guys have written books. It's one thing to put a book out there, right? It could die in the vine or it can, it can get some legs. It can get some mileage, right? This particular book got a lot of mileage. It was the readers. People read it, word traveled, um, especially on the internet about the search. And there was a couple of websites in particular that had devoted time to it and had a lot of discussion about it. Um, and so the readers, it was really readers that kept the, that kept the story alive. And then that kept the tips coming into me and I would write about it. You know, I had the blog and I kept writing it on my website and I would update folks. It wasn't every week. It wasn't every month. It might've been one every six months. Like, Oh, Hey, here's another update, you know, and people would just devour it. They go, Oh, you know, they read it. In after we found her identity, in 2014, or actually after the FBI did. In 2016, I met, I, I had spoken to Megan for years over the phone, the daughter, but I actually met her in New Orleans. 
and during that course, during that conversation, one thing I always wanted to do when I first started the book, when she was buried in 1990, she was known by the name of Tanya Hughes or Tanya, Tanya Tadlock was a maiden, supposed maiden name, but her married name was Tanya Hughes. No one knew who she was, right? Her real name. So when she was buried, she was buried with just one name on the tombstone and it was Tanya. And it was a name that was stolen off the tombstone. It was a name that was used during probably the most miserable part of her life um, in Tulsa. And I just said to myself, I said, I hope one day, you know, either during the course of writing the book or after the book comes out, we could find your identity and we could change the name on a tombstone. So in 2016, I was talking, you know, when I was talking to Megan, I said, listen, I said, how would you feel, you know, if we went to Tulsa, we changed the tombstone and she was into it. So, you know, in 2017, in June of 2017, um, we did that and we, we put a real name. We, we, we swapped out the tombstone with one with a real name. Her father, meaning Sharon or Suzanne, her real name is Suzanne. Um, her father lived on the West Coast. He came. Um, the law enforcement officials that were all part of the story. And this is a testament to the girl herself, Sharon, even though, even though very few of us had met her. Um, all the law enforcement officials, FBI, U.S. attorneys, they all came. And then the friends came, friends that she had gone to high school with. They came from Florida. They came from New Orleans. It was really, it was incredible. And I was just hoping that, you know, <laughs> we'd have, and we even had the guy who put, who, who put the tombstone together. He worked for the headstone company. He was, he actually turned out to be a retired chaplain and he had just retired from the Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, which is outside of Tulsa police department. And he said, and he read the book after doing the headstone. And he said, Matt, he goes, if it's all right with you, I'd be honored if I can do the eulogy. And I said, sure. Right. So we get there and there's 30 something people that showed up. We kept it somewhat small um, and, you know, no media or anything like that. And he delivered a beautiful eulogy and the whole thing was just so beautiful. It turned out to be just so, I mean, it just organically, it's just like, went from it was so heartfelt it was just like one person said something after another person said something after it was just it was a very it turned out to be a very memorable memorable day and one that i'm very i'll always remember so that was the really good part of the story you know um i i've listened to the to the book just recently and uh, you do the uh the talking <laughs> yeah I don't, know how you, I don't know how you got the courage to do that i i can never do an audio book, even though I work on radio. It's crazy. Um, but what what is it you hope uh, people take away from this book? Um, well, from finding Sharon, uh, being able to, well, one, it brings closure to the story. It brings closure for a lot of people. I mean, not just me. It brings closure for the family, law enforcement that was involved in these years. Also, importantly, it brings closure for readers, those readers, you know, all over the world who read the book and who and many of them kept emailing me, you know, what's the latest on Sharon? You know, that's how affected they were by this story. And it and it brought it brought closure. Uh I think the other thing is that the book, one of the reasons why people were attracted to it also is that it's pretty much it's it's a it's a traditional story of good versus evil. And even though she dies, and even though her son is killed, um, we were able to, you know, through the contributions of a number of people, find a conclusion, you know, find her identity, connect her family members, and, and, and you know, give closure to her friends. When her, her real father, when I, I, when I found, that, found out Sharon's identity in 2014, you know, I, I called the mother, and it was as if, her reaction was just, I was so disturbed by her reaction. It was as if she may have lost a cat. It was like, no big deal. I emailed the father and he sent me back this terse email and said, I, I don't want to talk about it. Don't contact me again. I was like, oh, okay. And then I let it go. Two months before, that was in 2014. 
Fast forward to 2017, two months before the, the headstone service, I get this email around 12 o'clock. My phone pings. I open it up, and it's from him. His name is Cliff. And I read it, and it was probably one of the most heartfelt emails I've ever read, in which he basically explains the emotional trauma that he suffered through when he found out what happened to his daughter, because he had given her up. He had given up her parental rights to her many years earlier. I mean, in the early 1970s. And he explains, I mean, you know, he turned out to be a good guy. He, he explains what happened, why he did it. He explains what happened after he FBI came to see him. He explains what he had gone through over the last two and a half years after he found out. You know, how he had to go for therapy and, you know, visit with his, uh, you know, with his priest. You know, it took two years of just, you know, going through this entire thing and his own looking and in, looking inward into himself and trying to come to terms with what happened. You know, and he just he apologized for how, you know, the email he had sent me initially, which, you know, he didn't really have, he didn't have to do, of course, but. It was really, and I, then at the end of the conversation, I said, by the way, Cliff, I said, listen, you know, I called him a couple of days later and we spoke and, um, I said, I told him about the headstone ceremony. I said, any chance, you know, he lives on the West coast. I said, any chance you want to come? He goes, of course. And he was there. And so the picture's in the book and, and, and that's when he met, like he didn't even know he had a granddaughter, which was Megan. And he met Megan for the first time at the headstone ceremony. And happily, they Cliff was at her wedding a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, they were able to, f to form and continue a, a really good relationship. For me, getting something like that out of a book, that was great. For readers, I think it brought closure. But I think also the story itself, it just shows that what someone can do, even faced with such horrendous circumstances, to watch this girl excel during high school, to see what she did and how she was able to do it. To me, that was remarkable. Yeah. It's it's almost like it shows her strength. Absolutely. Even with, even with such challenges at it was, the time being so young. The strength of the, it was, the, it's the strength of the human, of the human spirit uh, and, and her humanity. And, and that's what attracted all of us who were part of this story uh, to her and to the story. I mean, look, I mean, I'm sure the National Center, and they do, and the FBI, they deal with tens of thousands of cases like this every year, right? Right. And people have asked me, why Sharon? You know, why this story? And it was that. It was her humanity. It was, you know, her inner strength, her ability to basically, you know, find a way to try to succeed, you know, against just a horrific life. So people are drawing uh, inspiration. So it's... uh. It's a rare case of something very, very positive in a, a genre that can be very, very grim. Absolutely. Right. It is a grim genre. And that's that's a perfect word for it. It's a very grim genre. And that's what makes this story so unusual. And that's what made it so, I hate to use the word, but popular yeah. uh, amongst readers. Um, you know, it's your atypical true crime story. It, does it become emotionally hard to work within true crime? I'm always saying to Al that I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't be able to handle it. Does it, uh, do, do you find it uh, casts a shadow over you while you're uh, immersed in a story like this? You know, it's funny. I didn't set out and I don't, I mean, I don't, and this isn't meant to disparage anyone else that follows true crime, but I don't consider myself a true crime writer. I've written, I've written other books. You know, I did the book on Sammy Davis Jr. Um, and, you know, he died $15 million in debt. And I wrote a book about how this all happened. So you're you're primarily a journalist. I mean, that's that's the first yeah, I'm a, yeah, a journalist, an investigative reporter. But I yeah. but I used to I did cover true crime for People Magazine, and that was my entree into the Durst story. I I actually covered that for People, and, and it was while working on the Durst story that I met this private investigator in Texas, and we became friendly. Her name is Bobby Basha, and she sent me the picture of the girl that we know have known as Sharon Marshall. And I was still working as a, you know, covering true crime and human interest stories for people. So, you know, uh, I, you know, I mean, I, in writing it, do I get, 
I, I do. I mean, obviously, I got in deep in these two, you know, the Durst story and this one, because uh, the Durst story had no ending. I mean, he was just convicted of killing um, Susan Berman a couple of months ago. Right. Right. And he was just charged with Kathy Durst, who was the subject of my book 20 years ago. And that just happened. It's disturbing. I mean, when I got, the, I have the pictures and I've never, a handful of people have seen them, but I have, you know, copies of the pictures of the girl Cheryl Camesso as, you know, Floyd took pictures as he was torturing her. And it was just utterly dis- just depraved and disgusting. And, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. You don't forget it. Just a product of a very sick mind. Um, you know, so that, yeah. that part of it, I'm not, I don't, you know, the violence part of it, I'm not attracted to. I know a lot of people who like true crime are. Um, I'm not. I'm more interested mm-hmm. in the story behind it. Like what makes this person tick? What makes that person tick? I don't think, I don't think I would have done. Yeah. And there were some stories I probably wouldn't have done that, are, you know, true crime stories. I, you know, for me to do a book, to do it, let's say a true crime book. Yeah. It has to, you know, it has to meet. There have to be like two, three, four different things going on at one time for me to really want to dive in and do it. So it has to be something for me, especially when you're doing a book. I mean, a magazine piece, eh, you know, there might be a couple of things you're looking for. But with a book, it ha- yeah, in order to do a book and write 75 to 100,000 words, it has to be a number of different things going that are going on at one point in time. I don't like to focus in on a lot of the, the gore itself in the book you have to be part of it in order to get through it and understand the story um but i i definitely understand this i i i wonder but you know when you come out of this um do you ever look back and and see a change within yourself from before to after from the, from the things you've learned and the people you've met interesting that's a that, that's a <laughs> that's a pretty good question I'm actually, I mean, I guess, I mean, in terms of changes, when you do a book, look, you do a book, you write the book, you have to go out, you have to promote it, you know, you do certain things. Um, and then some folks might criticize you for taking advantage of a story, you know, and it's like, wait a minute, you know, I, I, I wrote a book and obviously we want people to read the book and it's just, it's just a part of what you do, you know, as an author. Um, you know, but I, I find myself still, I mean, even this other project that I think, you know, we mentioned and then we can't mention, but, um, (laughs) but it's going to be, it's going to be really cool. Um, you know, it's, it's near the final stages and, you know, um, I'm, I'm very, it's just some really great people are working on it, very talented people working on it and they really honored the story and, um, I'm very excited about it. So, you know. I can let myself loose a little bit and say that, but typically I don't, you know? So I think uh, when you ask if if over the years have anything changed, I don't know. That's a good question. And I'm not, I'm really, you know, and I'm being honest, I don't know if I can answer that. I mean, probably, I mean, my wife would probably be able to say that, answer that question, but yeah, you know, well, I honestly think it's something that you notice later. Like it it, it comes out when you're doing the next project that, I, that's how I find it. All of a sudden, I, I I think of something and I realize how I handle something a little bit differently than I yeah. did I'll during. Agree. Yes, know. I will. I will actually. I will agree with that. You know, I'm working on a new book. I have more tolerance for certain things, and I don't sweat the small stuff. I will tell you one thing, and, and the people on this other project probably will <laughs> testify to this. I can be intense. I mean, I could, I could, I could be really intense. And when I'm locked into something, I don't think I'm intense when I'm talking. But then you see the reaction of people, and it's like, whoa, wait a minute, what are you doing? And it's like, you're from Brooklyn, right? I am. Yeah, like, just like, just like my father. I mean, what I've experienced, I grew up in Jersey. Is sometimes if I cross into other geographical places, I realize like, oh, this is not how they communicate around here. No, I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly the most direct person in the scenario, yeah. especially. And I will tell you this, and I've been dealing, you know, my books have been optioned before. Yeah. Um, you know, my Durst book was a TV movie. Um, my Sammy book, my Sammy book's been optioned since it came out. And God knows when that's going to get done. Uh-huh. But um, when you talk to, when you talk to people, when you talk to Hollywood people, when you talk to people, yeah. it's completely different. 
Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm oh, in something my. right now with an option. It's in like a different planet. Yeah, like yes. and I can't. I wish I could uh, talk on and on about that because you just hit on something. Yeah, it really is uh, the the culture. It's like you have to have three lunches before you uh, even start broaching the subject. <laughs> it's not even that. It's how it's, yeah. it's how it's how subjects are broached. Everyone right eggshells. Oh my god! And then also nobody's uh, nobody's loyal. Like there's like no humanity. It's like well, that's God, a, yeah. God forbid anybody should say, "Don't worry, we'll be fine. I got your back." And like it, it would never happen because the ecosystem is so like every person for themselves. That's another issue. But that's another issue. <laughs> yeah. we, won't, we won't get into that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm working on a brand new book which is actually shrouded in secrecy. It hasn't even been. It, it, it's going to be Harper Collins is going to publish it. I'm not even allowed to talk about it, other than say I'm doing another book. It's amazing, and especially in this day and age with streaming and whatnot, now everyone's looking for content. Um, you know, I mean, I'm getting calls. I, even a beautiful child in Finding Sharon, which have been locked up for a couple of years now with the, these other folks that are working on it. Um, I get two, three queries a month. Is wow. it available? You know, my Durst book, um, you know, I got a query last week on it. You know, is it available? Oh, nice. Everyone's looking for stuff. You know, my Sammy Davis, I said, go talk to the guy that's got it now. Yeah. So, uh, and that keeps you busy. And then it's like, you know, even this new book, which isn't going to be out for another year and a half or so, um, folks heard, you know, there are some folks who heard I was working on a new book out in Hollywood and they want to know what it's about and, can we, you know, get first dibs on it and stuff like that? So it's actually, I mean, it's actually pretty interesting times. I mean, it was a period in the 90s and early 2000s where folks were always looking for, for, for material for, you know, TV movie of the week. That kind of went away a bit. And then, you know, true crime over the last number of years has made a huge comeback. And then you got podcasts, you know, that's the whole other thing, you know, podcasts. And, you know, I ended up doing, you know, you mentioned the audio book on Finding Sharon, which just came out a few months ago. I did do that one, and it wasn't easy. No. It was really hard <laughs> work. That's a and, lot of work. You know, it was basically, hey, Matt, you know, this is really, like, in part your story. Why don't you do the narration? And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm a guy from Brooklyn, and I got a Brooklyn accent. You really want to hear me? And it was like, yeah. It's like, you know, you did it, so you should tell it. And so that's what I did. I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure I would do that with any of my other books. No, but the good thing is that it it comes from the heart. Like it, it, even with the accent and all that stuff, when the mm. person talking um, knows it inside and out, like when you're talking, you can tell that it comes across that's you. This is this is something that you're telling the story, so it's good. You don't have to have that, you know, uh, perfect. Right diction and all this great you know great radio voice or anything so i think it's perfect i think it's the way audiobooks should be if it can be i'm just i'm just too self-conscious i and i hate my voice <laughs> and i use it for a living it's you crazy. actually yeah no you actually you actually have a very good voice i mean we talking earlier <laughs> I, I i mentioned that to you me you know i mean you know really you think i should do this yeah go ahead and do it like even with you know here's another i'm older right I'm not into social media. Yeah. Okay. It's a whole, you know, my career started years ago. Um, <laughs> so I have, you know, there's a, there's a friend of mine, a woman named Kate, and she has a company called Front Porch Social. And she's a social media pro. And, you know, we started working on some stuff. And I don't have a clue. I mean, it's just like, and I kind of cringe sometimes when I look at this stuff. You know, it's like, let's post some stuff on Instagram. Let's do this. Let's do that. And I'm like, that's not my thing. But I will tell you this, you know, I, even though it's not my thing, like with my new, my, my new book deal, and the publishers want it. They want yeah. you to have a social media presence, no matter how many books you've written, no matter how many books you may have sold. They want, you know, they want you out there. They, want, they, they basically want you to do their work for them, by like bringing to them thousands of readers. Right. Yeah. So, the marketing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's whole, you know, it's this whole new world. So it's like, right, Matt, we're going to do some... You want to do some YouTube stuff? You want to do this? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, that's my worst nightmare. It is like we just had a we just had a conversation today. It's like you know we need to do like you know it's kind of building up. I think my you know people are read. Well, no, I can't say that. I, people read my work for all ages, especially Finding Sharon and a, and a Beautiful Child. But it's kind of building up slowly, like with the Instagram thing, for instance. 
I'm thinking in the back of my head, maybe we should just bag it. But I also know how important it is to reach out. Because when we do, there might be a post here and there that we put up there that gets a lot of reaction. And I could see the power of social media. You have to look at it as branding. It's kind of branding your name and who you are. Right. And and right. you put out lots of it. It still stays floating out there, even if it doesn't. Some things I do, uh, you get very little in, interest in, and all of a sudden, a year later, people are, are sharing it and talking about it. It's the weirdest thing. And it seems very foreign if you're a little bit older. You know, next you'll be on TikTok. No, uh-huh. absolutely not. <laughs> Yeah, line somewhere. Well, no, but you know, book talk is huge now. Book and talk. Yeah, they talked me into doing three of those things, and I'm telling you, um, in in like uh, 700 views a day, it's just like what? Oh, that's pretty good. Oh, nice. Oh, that's pretty sad. It's uh, people have nothing better to do than uh, I don't know. It's just it seems really. Weird. Yeah. My, I've, real, real, real quickly, I have a brother that. Um, he sends me these TikTok videos all the time, like the dumbest stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, come on, man. His name is Paul. Don't send me any more of this stuff. <laughs> um, I mean, you yeah. know, it's like people dancing, <laughs> cats, cats jumping. I don't know. It's just. Yeah, yeah. And- well, actually, no, but with the book talk, all you do is you just, it's just a moving video of your latest book, and it's got a little bit of, of theme music and kind of it's available and it might hit a few parts of the story you don't have to do really a whole lot i don't do the goofy stuff you know yeah (laughs) that's so that's so all right so that's the kind of stuff that we are talking about for the future yeah kind of stuff we're talking about when my new book comes out that's the kind of stuff we're talking about you know if i get any queries like in terms of the follow-up to you know let's say these other projects that are happening surrounding my work um, there are avenues to go down. I need to get my head into it. I need to embrace it. I'm having a hard time doing that mm-hmm. because of, you know, how many years I've been, you know, a journalist and what I've done and I've never done this before. So, yeah. um, you know, it's really just a matter of saying, Hey, you need to embrace this and go forward with it or, or don't. Yeah. So right. um, I think, I think <laughs> just, just jump into it and don't think about it and don't watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely definitely yeah. don't read the comments either yeah just stay away from it um and just keep moving it's just about getting it out there because you know so you can get a cat and jump around and you'll be fine yeah, yeah. no I but matt, matt i'm really uh i'm really curious with the way you uh run your career in terms of the seven books so far and the eighth one coming uh and the, the sammy davis jr one or whether it goes more in a crime direction like are you every time out deciding the book you're going to write? Like, is it completely a one-to-one ratio? It's personally your choice, or is it more in the ecosystem of your agent, publisher, or what your readers are asking for? How does that work? No, it's my choice. It's It's always you. This is something that I want to do. I actually wrote a book to, what, a summer ago? It was actually my first work of fiction that my agents actually have now. I, I really enjoyed writing. We're trying to slot that either before or after my Next book comes out, which is nonfiction. Listen, you know, you guys know when you do a book, you know, my projects are typically two years. Like the one I'm working on now, I got the first email about it in August of 2020. And I've just begun writing it. Like I finished my research. I've begun writing it and it'll take two years. I mean, I'm going to turn the book in next spring, you know, and then we got to go through the editing process and everything. So you're going to devote two years of your life to a project and you want it to be good. So it has to be something that you're really interested in. Yeah. It has to be personal. Yeah. That you want, well, it's something, it has to be a really good story that you, that you know, you can dive in and it's going to really get your attention and you're going to enjoy doing it. Um, I don't know. Sometimes writing a book, is really difficult. And I don't know if sometimes if people like, you know, other writers actually enjoy the writing part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, excuse me for me, you know, I'll have, I'll, once I'm locked in, I'm locked in and my head's just in that zone. And I'm like, I tell my wife, like we even had this discussion a few weeks ago because I started writing. I'm like, listen, you know, I'm getting there. So once it happens, boom, you know, and it's like, basically just leave me be. So yeah, so, and it's like that for the for the duration of the four or five months it's going to take me to write it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's got to be yeah, that's got to be very delicate considering you're uh, in general aside from the new fiction one working with all these nonfiction components that you have to weave into a structure that's compelling. That, so you're yeah. not only you're managing the factual, but you also have to make it readable, and that's 
It's That's, it's a thread, threading a needle. Absolutely. And that was the most difficult part of doing A Beautiful Child because the story was yeah. just so much stuff going on. And and basically you had this crazy story, and, and the, the task was how do you tell it? How do you tell it in a cohesive way that's going to keep the reader's interest um, and it will carry them from beginning to the end? So, yeah. you know, it's the same thing. You know, when I write like my books, it's more I kind of write. It's more like fiction. You know, they're like, nonfiction, but they read like fiction. Right, um, right. Take everything you've got and all your research. And then, you know, some writers will have a wall with ideas and how they're going to tell the story. Me, I just do it in my head. It's always okay. been the best way for me. It's just like, what's the beginning? What's the middle? What's the end? And boom, I go. Nice. Yeah. And you said within the whole couple of years, there's that research window and there's the compiling and thinking. and But the writing itself, you said, is more like a four to five month situation. Yeah. Um, yeah, pretty much for me. It's roughly four, four or five months. I think I, I did Deconstructing Sammy in September, like three and a half months. Gotcha. Um, That's good. That speaks to, I, I, like you said, locking in and sort of like, yeah, the door gets closed to an extent. Like, I think when you are locked in that way and you have your own momentum, I think it gives the book momentum. It's yeah. like, you know, it's like the spark you know, sets the fire. It's like, away we go. We got it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're in that yeah. zone, you know, and I was working, you know, I was working a newspaper job at the time, too. So I would get up, you know, you got to be disciplined. And I would get up at six. I'd write till nine, do my do my work and I'd get home and write as long as I could at night. And then every weekend for, you know, three, four months. Nice. Until, yeah. until the book comes out. But yeah, once you're locked in and once you're in that zone and it's just you just keep going. So yeah. I love it. Well, but 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 now you're you've made it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> sort of yeah um yeah i mean it's um yeah i mean it's it's good but you always you know what it is you don't look unless you know with the stories with without the endings the durst and of course with a beautiful child and finding sharon those stories still stay with you and you're still working on them and they linger but once you finish your book you always you're looking for your neck you, you look into a take a break and then b What's your next project? What do you want to do? I really enjoyed the non, doing the, non, the fiction book. Um, that, to me, was probably the most fun in terms of putting it together. Yeah, because you're not, you're not tied. You don't have to have the fidelity to the actual record. You're, you're free. Correct. You can be yes. spontaneous. And, yeah. Right. You have, to, you have to, with nonfiction, you know, and that's my pet peeve with, with some writers, which we won't mention, but... You know. Uh, oh, come on. Give it to us. No. <laughs> no we'll, we'll have them on the show next week. <laughs> you, have to, no, you, you have to stay true to the story. I mean, that's the one thing. It's like you're going to put it out there. And if it's nonfiction, it's got to be factual. You know, when you do, the, the one thing I did learn, especially, you know, let's say with documentaries, they do have some license to change things around. Like if, they'll, if they adapt a book, for instance, they can, you know, and it will work, you know, we can, you know, something happened in April, but we need it to have happened in September, then, you know, they'll do it. And that's fine. I, that I don't have a problem with, because they're actually, they're telling a, they're telling a kind of a different a story, but a kind of different story. And it works better in terms of a documentary format. And they, it's how they have to do that. You know, with a book, it's almost, you know, you have to stay with the record. You can't fudge anything, you yeah. know, because people will find out. Yeah, you're you're held to a different standard. Oh, uh, I mean, sometimes I'll get letters, and someone was, I mean, just the most picky yeah. and stuff. I was just like, where did you see that? You know, like they'll say, hey, you <laughs> yeah. know, on, on page, you know, twenty nine of, you know, a beautiful child, and I'm like, what? You know, yeah. it's like, where you, you know, the one guy of the thousands of people I read the book, he's gonna point something out like that, and you want to know something? Sometimes they're right. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, my wife and I own a newspaper here in uh, Silicon Valley. We're dealing with this daily. It's like, exactly as you said, it's like, wow, that's actually the detail they're zeroing in on. And then you have to go and check, and it's mind-blowing. Right. Um, yeah, but it also, it's uh, it's interesting uh, straddling when it comes to nonfiction, because you can make it exciting and emotional, but you have to find that sweet spot. Like, there's the, there's the liability of it being dry if you're, if you're uh, too much leaning on the facts. The one thing with the one thing with nonfiction that I've had the most difficult with, and and that I have learned over the years to get back to your earlier question, is when you're doing dialogue, and that is for me. I'll in, you know ha people say to me, how are you how how can you repeat dialogue someone said 10, 15 years ago, and when I interview people, I'll just say to them, hey, 
put me back in that place. Put me in that conversation as best as you can remember. What happened? What were you talking about? Okay. Yeah. And I will put, and I'll put the dialogue together from what they're telling me. Okay. So, and it's worked. I mean, you know, no one that I've written about has come back to me and said, Matt, you got that completely wrong. You know? Yeah. That's, that's an interesting touch too, because there's a sort of a, it lives in a sort of poetic space when you're doing nonfiction dialogue. It's like, I, I, you, the reason they must not be complaining is you must be capturing the underlying rhythm or emotion of what happened and it becomes less about the words. Correct. But the words are pretty close to what they're telling me. Right. Like, they're right. telling me what happened. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm taking something from a, you know, a source document, like a document or something, obviously I'm going to write it verbatim. You know, if I'm doing something that someone's trying to remember from 10 years ago, and I'm trying to recreate a conversation from that point in time, you know, I'll just continue to drill and fit every little detail I could find. And then just, right. say, you know, and then put it together. And then they'll read the book and go, Matt, you got that. It's, you know. It's, nice, it's, nice. It's basically how the conversation went. So, you know, when I did the Durst book, you know, I kind of, I, and it's actually you have to practice. I mean, the more you do it, the better you get at it. You know, the Durst book, I would just say that I'm, I'm good with all the conversations that are in it. Um, but let's just say I probably would have tightened up a few of them. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. But that was my very, that was my very first book, you know? Um, so over the course of my career in terms of doing that, I guess that's the one thing that I've kind of really honed in on. Matt, we'd love to talk to you forever, but uh, we are <laughs> running out of time. So um, how do you like people to get a hold of you? Uh, you're running a website right now, or, and of course you love everybody to follow you on TikTok. <laughs> Okay, well, when I when when the day comes when I have a TikTok account, which I won't, then I'll let you know. But yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so I do have a website. It's mattburkbeck.com, and through that you can find me on Instagram as well as YouTube. Um, there's some neat stuff. There's some neat stuff on both of them. You know, on the YouTube channel, it is actually is a really good, cool video of Russell Buffalino who folks oh, will cool. remember from the movie The Irishman, who is, that's from my book, The Quiet Don. And it's got like 800,000 views or so. And then there's a Sammy Davis Jr. video from an interview I did some years ago. And so we're going to be posting some more up, uh, more videos up as the, uh, as the months go by. I appreciate you, and uh, we appreciate the work you do. So um, our guest, Matt Birkbeck, thank you for being here. I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.